Praise God. Last week we talked about part one of the path to redemption. And we laid some foundational scriptures before us that God knew what man needed before he ever put him on the earth. And he made provision and he began to make plans uh, that you and I could be already knew. But it was just a matter, it was written down so you and I could know. Amen. And he said the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. It was a done deal then. It's just a matter of it being worked out. The first mention in the Bible talked about the seed of the woman. And he talked about it right there following the fall that there was redemption. We talked last week about how he, uh, God slew an animal and he clothed him. And we ended the message by him clothing us with his righteousness. And so we know God's got a plan for man to redeem man. And redeem us from yeah. the curse of the law. Amen. He redeemed us from sin and the bondage of sin. So you and I have a hope today. Amen. And we want to continue uh, that uh, message today. We also talked about worship and how that Cain and Abel, they begin to worship God. That's what we've been doing here this morning. As we were singing those songs, I, I was just praying, oh Lord God, would you receive glory Amen. and honor and praise. Because that's why we're here, to adore and honor our Lord Jesus Christ and, and, and just worship the God that you and I serve. And as a result of that, the benefits of that is you and I get to experience His presence Amen. and the comfort and the joy. I wish I could tell it all uh, in just a few minutes, but I cannot. But I do want to tell what I do know and what's heavy upon my heart today. We want to go to part two of the path to redemption. It's written beginning in the book of Genesis. I don't know if you know it or not, but Jesus Christ is the theme of this Bible from the beginning to the end. And in fact, when it was about to end up, and He gave John uh, this revelation. He, he made reference to that. And, and, and Jesus, in His words, He said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I started this thing and I'll end it. Yes, and so amen. God's got a plan in the midst of everything that you and I see uh, to see those who believe and trust in Him through. But, but He gave these things and He written them down in this book, what we call the Holy Bible. And if there's ever a book that you need to believe, it's this one. Amen. We don't understand it all, but we understand some of it. And God will help us to understand enough of it. Right. That you and I can experience the power in it uh, to trust in Him for the things that are written down in this book. We want to begin today in Genesis chapter 17 and, and verse number 19, uh, where he, God talks about this seed actually in this uh, this verse, and it was actually a promise God made to, uh, to some somebody that He chose. Now the Bible says God chose us. Right. God chose us uh, in Christ. That is where we are chosen. And so He gives us a message as to how you and I can establish that position. It is done through faith. That may be a little bit out there for some of you. But I'm just saying, this is God's choice. Amen. God chooses us in Christ. So if you have a question as to whether or not you're there, hopefully the Holy Spirit will help you to understand that. But I want to go back to that seed in, in uh, verse number 19. God said uh, to Abraham, He said, Sarah, your wife shall bear a son indeed. It didn't look like it was going to happen. But ladies and gentlemen, because God said it, it did happen. Amen. It was a part of His plan. And He said, you'll call His name Isaac. And He said, I'll establish my covenant with Him for an everlasting covenant and with His seed after Him. And so here we see that seed that was mentioned there going on. It goes all the way through the Bible until it comes. And then he re references the word that he gave us as the incorruptible seed, which actually points to Christ. Now in Genesis chapter 21, uh, he's, he's making reference again to this offspring that's going to come from Abraham and Sarah. Now Abraham is uh, he's he's beginning to be an old man. He has this promise earlier in life that God's going to establish a nation <coughs> through his seed. He calls him out from her of the Chaldees, and he you know I want you to go to a place. I'm going to establish a nation of people for my name. 
And so he tells Abraham this story. And so Abraham, he believes God. I just like Amen. folks that believe God, don't you? I, he just simply believed God because God said it. He just obeyed. You cannot separate faith from obedience. And so he believed God, and as a result of that, he did what God told him to do. He just left and went, didn't know where he was going, but he just knew he was going where God told him to go. And so he headed out in that direction. Some of us today, we got, we got to have the blueprint, you know, seem like, uh, well, Lord, what's going to happen after that? Well, he don't always tell us. But I do know one thing, he's always in charge. Amen. If we'll just follow him. Just like Abraham was when he stepped out, he's going, time passes just like it does in mine in your life. You know, we read God's word, we have some promises and things that are stated there, and we wonder, you know, is it ever going to happen? You know, our pace some our faith and our patience sometimes is tested just like Abraham's was. <coughs> Excuse me. But God is always on time. Man. Now Abraham didn't think so and Sarah didn't think so and he began to talk to uh, God about, about it all he had at that particular time was servants and slaves and he began to say Lord is this going to be my heir and God told him no well time continued to pass and he kept talking to God about it and Sarah says let's just go ahead and fix this thing since I've got a slave here if it's going to be through your seed you just go ahead and we'll, we'll take care of that and we'll have a child uh, through, through one of our servants. And uh, of course, being a natural man, he was able to say, all right, we'll just go ahead and do that. No argument there. But anyway, nevertheless, that happened. But you know, every time man tries to mess with the plan of God, he messes it up. God never intended that to happen, but it did. But it was because they got a little bit impatient. Did God forsake them because they missed it? They're absolutely not. But it caused some problems, and it usually does. But God can see us through that. Amen. If you made bad decisions, I'm going to tell you something. God can see you through right. that, right. and He'll help you to overcome that in life. That's a part of this redemption we're talking about here. And so, so God spoke to him, and things uh, continued to pass, and, and, and time was running out, and, and there were some, some real issues that continued to take place. But in verse number 12 of Genesis 21, God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the land. Because they had to send him away. They had to separate that that was of the flesh between that that was of the spirit. Now we struggle with that naturally today. Amen. With the spirit man and the, and the carnal man, the flesh man. And so this is an illustration that that has to be separated. It, we cannot uh, continue in the flesh. They started out, but that had to be separated. So... So God told him, Sarah was having a little problem with this because that boy that was born out of the flesh, he was uh, causing that other boy uh, some problems. Making fun of him. Just like they do today, ladies and gentlemen of God's people. You and I begin to cry out and tell the world what the answer is and they mock and scoff. It, it hasn't changed much. But, but I want to tell you something. God's uh, power and God's promises and His presence and His plan will redeem us and sustain us. We still have the answer. Even though it is mocked and ridiculed, we must separate that out of our mind and we must continue to follow in the Spirit and according to the promises of God's Word and watch His mighty hand bring about redemption for us even in our present circumstances. Amen. But He said, you got to let Him go. Let it not be grievous because of the land, because of thy bondwoman, in all that Sarah has said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. Gentlemen, sometimes you just need to listen to your wife. And all the while said. Amen. Amen. <laughs> but he said, in Isaac, I, I'll tell you what the argument is of the man. Well, you talked me into this the first uh -huh. place. Uh -huh. It's a lot, doesn't it? Yeah. Let's go on. I didn't intend to talk about that long. But he said, and Isaac shall thy seed be called. Right. And so, so God made a promise to Abraham. And even though uh, Abraham now, he was getting up there in age, he was approaching 100 years old, and, and Sarah 9. Is there anybody in here 100 years old? No, nope, she's home today. <laughs> but, but they were past childbearing, both of them. Abraham was in them, and so was Sarah, and bringing about children. And, but God's promise was still effective. And so what I want to say right here, when you and I get to that place where we're infinite, we cannot make it happen. There are some things that God says in His Word that you and I cannot make happen. Yes. We are impotent in that respect. Yes. 
We cannot. And so we take the promise of God, we still hold to the promise of God, Amen. and we listen to what God says in our struggles, and we trust God uh, to bring it to pass. And in chapter 22, after this child has come, they conceive miraculously, and, and a child is born. And here he is, he's grown, he's grown up to be what we would refer to as a teenager today. And uh, because he's old enough, because of the instructions that we find in this chapter, we know he's old enough there pretty good. I, I did have one time what, about what age he was, but that's irrelevant. But anyway, God told him to take that son and offer him up uh, to him. In verse 2, he said, Take now thine only son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and uh, you go to a land, go to that land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early the next morning, and he did just like he did when he called him out of uh, Ere of the Chaldees and told him to go to a land I'm going to show you. He began to, to proceed and do what God says, even though I can promise you he did not fully comprehend or understand why God did it. He just simply knew God said it, and so he proceeded to do what God said. And so he took the lad and he took the necessary things with him, took a couple of servants with him up into that mountain. And he, he was going there. What he said was to worship. Ladies and gentlemen, the highest order of worship today is obedience. Don't ever Man. forget that. That is worship. When you obey God, that is worship. And so Abraham, he, he believed God. He continued to do what God said. But he could not have done this had he not had a word previously. There's some things that you cannot do or you won't do if you don't have a word from God previously that deals with what you're about to deal with. But if you have the Word of God in your heart and you allow the Holy Spirit to bring that, make it alive to you, whatever it is God tells you to do, I can promise you, you can do it. Amen. God will see you through. We just need to respond appropriately by the Holy Spirit and by God as He speaks to us through His written Word and as He speaks to us by His Spirit which will not contradict this written Word that He's given us. And so, they head out uh, to that mountain up there uh, to worship God. They, they, they bring the firewood and, and all and, and, uh, and, and Isaac's beginning to have some questions now and he asked his father, he said, we have some fire and we have some wood, but where is the offering? Mm -hmm. He didn't realize at that moment in time that he was it. Right. In verse 80, Abraham said, my son, God will preside, provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Man. So they went both of them together. Here we see a prophetic word by a man who intended to obey God and do what God said. He had a prophetic word. He probably didn't even at the moment realize what he was saying. But this prophetic word came from God. Sometimes God will move upon His people when He's dealing with them. And God will give you something and you'll say it before you have time to think. If you think it through, you probably won't say it because it's just it, it seems like it's not uh, appropriate at the time. But it's powerful. And many of you could go back and probably share some experiences even as I, where this has taken place in your life. But he said God who provide, provide himself a lamb. So they began to move out. The boy was fine. He moved on out with him. And he was there. He took the lad. He bound him. And he laid him upon that altar. Drew back his knife. Bound him up. There's, there's a lot more to this story than I'm able to go into. But this lad was old enough to outpower a hundred-year-old man. Well, actually, he's over a hundred. He's a hundred plus ever how old Isaac is. He could have outpowered him. But what he did because of the type of who he was and the story that was being told that pointed to a future Messiah he yielded himself to his father's words and he allowed himself to be bound and laid upon that wood and that sacrifice. And Abraham carried that knife with him and he drew it back. 
to, to, to slay his own son that God gave him by promise. And as an angel spoke to him, and whatever word you need, if you ever enter something, most of us will never enter anything as a greater test. But you'll not be tested above that you're able. Amen. God knew Abraham was able, so he gave him the test. And he passed the test. He drew back that knife, going to do everything God said. The angel spoke to him and said, Wait. I want to read you. He said, Lay not your hand upon the lad, neither do you anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God. Some of you think of believe you already, didn't he? Possibly so. I want to just, just share a little tidbit of information with you. God can hide anything from himself he wants to. He can hide mine in your sin. He can hide anything else. There's some things he may tell you. And if that was the case, then it fits. It's an order. Sometimes you and I just need to obey God. And, and God, God will see it through no matter what. But I know God. He's the Alpha and Omega. A lot of that in between there. If he wants to hide it from himself until the time he can. He has the ability to do it if he can hide my sin. That's right. And yours. From himself. Alright. I want to move on. And Abraham, after he received that word, he looked. He opened up his eyes and looked in verse 13 and says, Behold, behind him was a ram called him in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram, offered him up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. God will provide. Yeah. <laughs> oh, ain't that good? Yeah. Man, that's good. <laughs> Praise God. Not because I said it, but because God's word said it. That's what I'm talking about. God will provide Himself a lamb. He, and this whole message we're talking about is God's provision for the redemption of man. And here it is. A testimony in time of what God did. I want to go to Hebrews. This is after the fact. And it sheds some light on this fact that is taking place hundreds of years prior. You know why you ought to believe this Bible? Because it's true. Amen. It's been proved to be true. Anybody who says they don't, they don't, they don't know if it's true or not, haven't searched its content. Most of them are ignorant of what it says. They don't even know what it says. They've never even tested the truth as to whether or not what was said hundreds and thousands of years before come come to pass to the letter, just yeah. like it said. There was no way, possible way, it could be by accident. God's word is proven to be true. Years later. Paul writes to the Hebrews in chapter 11, beginning with verse 17. And this is what he said. By faith, Abraham, he's referring back to the story. When he was tried, he offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, which was a type. In verse 18, he says, Of whom it was said, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Verse 19, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which also he received him, figuratively speaking. So this was a type and a foreshadow of God's promise and path to redemption. Now, Paul writes about it there in Hebrews after the fact. And so we have, what we have is a, a confirmation of the word and what many times when we read something in the New Testament, what we'll read is, and this was that. And this was that. And Jesus, even when He was here, and He says to fulfill that, that was spoken. Right. So don't throw the Old Testament out the door, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. It's foundational. Oh, it's foundational to what was to take place in the future. There was another promise I want to go to in Deuteronomy. Chapter number 18 and verse 18. Jesus said, I will raise them up a prophet mm -hmm. from among their brethren like unto thee. God's talking to Moses here. Like unto thee. And I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Jesus, he said, I always say what my heavenly Father tells me right. to say. And if you and I could adopt that philosophy of life, we, a lot of people would be better off I hold off on that. And it shall come to pass 
that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, him, the words which he shall speak in my name, I will require it. So when you and I hear a presentation of the Word of God, then we are accountable. Amen. For what we hear. And for what the Holy Spirit blames a lie. Now there was people before Christ came expecting Him to come because yes. of that path of redemption. Throughout the Old Testament, I only covered just a, a couple of two or three things. There's a lot more than that. There's hundreds of things in there. That, that, that establishes that path of redemption that knowing that it wasn't just a second thought of God it was foundational from the beginning of the earth that God would provide for you and I I want you to know here this morning God cares enough about you yes. to provide you whatever you need to make it through whatever it is that he allows you to have to deal with by his divine providence here on this earth there's one thing he will not allow he will not allow, allow you to be tested or tempted more that you're able to bear Amen. if you're a child of His. So we have that promise and we can be encouraged today. But in, in John chapter 1, verse 19, and this is the record of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from the Jews of Jerusalem to ask Him, Who are you? Who do you think you are? That's what the term today would be. Who are you? Now how, how do you fit in to what this book says? you're supposed to be. Obviously, they recognized him as a, as a spiritual person, but they couldn't figure out exactly who he was and how he fit into it. And so they asked him. At least they had the audacity to ask. Some people don't even do that today. But they did ask him, who are you? And he confessed, and he did not deny, but confessed. He said, well, I'm not the Christ. Just want you to get that. I know that's not who I am. Some people just profess to be him. But he said, no, I'm not that one. And if you confess to be him, you're not either. We're just his representatives. But they asked him. He says, what then? Are you Elijah? Or Elias? He said, no, I'm not him either. You see, there's one promise to come. Another he ain't here yet. Elijah, remember the two witnesses going to come in the end? That's what they were asking about. See, they, they had this stuff in the Old Testament. He said, well, you should tell them a lot of stuff up there this morning. And I know if you're young in the Word of God, you're just picking it up little by little and bit by bit. But I'm going to tell you what, when you read it, you'll understand. Amen. When you pick up this Bible, you read that passage, the Holy Spirit says, yeah, that's what Brother Bill was talking about. You may not get it all today, but you will get it. If you will continue to read and study His Word Amen. and allow the Word of God to have an effect in your life. One thing I like about Brother Chuck is he's getting our young people into the Word. I hope us old folks are getting into it as good as they are. Because many of them are really getting into the Word of God. And that gives us strength and sustenance Amen. during these tough times. But he says, no, I'm not Elijah. And they said, well, you are, are you that prophet? And he said, no. You remember the one we just talked about in Deuteronomy? And God told Moses he's going to raise up. I'm going to raise up somebody like you. And there's another reference to that. But law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. You remember but this is what he's referring to. I'm going to raise you up another prophet. Well, see, Jesus was both prophet, priest, and king. Yes. But he was prophet also. And he prophesied. He on this earth. But that's the one he said, no, I'm not that one either. Actually, that one was the Christ. That one was the Messiah. They didn't get it. Of course, they didn't get a lot of things back in those days. I'm going to go to John chapter 5, quickly, verse 39. Jesus is still. Here Jesus is dealing with them about it. He's here on this earth at this time. And I know I'm kind of take us on the past, bring it to the present, but I got some more we'll fit in next week, the Lord willing. But in John chapter 5, verse 39, he's referring to those people who were into the scriptures. They were into it. They was reading the Bible. They were asking these questions because they knew there were some promises there. There was a prophet. There was a uh, there was a Messiah that was coming. We know the woman. You remember the well which is talking to Jesus says, We know the Messiah's coming, which is called Christ. He's going to tell us more than what we know now. We sing about that song sometimes, used to a lot anyway. I want to know more than I know now. Well, we can know more than they knew then because the Messiah has come and you and I have, have the Spirit, the indwelling Spirit that can teach us and help us to understand and comprehend greater things. But He told us to search the Scriptures. He says, for the in them. He's talking about just in the Word itself, in the letter. He says, for in them you think you have eternal life. 
And he said, they testify me. Amen. You see, we're talking about the sea. We're talking about the path to redemption. Jesus said, in him you think you have eternal life. He says, they testify of me. He says, then, but this is what he said in verse 40. If you're not a child of God, you need to listen closely. Verse says, He looked out at them and he said to them, You will not come into me. Every time you see an atheist or an agnostic or just somebody else, they fit in this category. They will not. It's not that they cannot. If a person's an atheist today or an agnostic or an unbeliever, they are that by choice. That's right. Come on. We have all the evidence anybody needs. That's right. It's not here in this book. If they just read it, search it out. He says, you will not. It's not that you can not. You can be. And the Word declares it. And God's presence is here powerful enough to make that happen to anyone who would dare to believe. He says, I receive not honor from men. Amen. Just a few minutes ago, you and I participated in one of the greatest privileges known to man. That is to honor our God Amen. with our substance. He owns it. Just to be able to honor Him in that matter. Helps us to know who we trust in tough times. Amen. Seriously. It's our Lord. I've got to move on from there. But now I know, or but I know, that ye have not a love of God in you. I'm coming in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another will come in his name, him you will receive. How can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Do not think that I will accuse you of the Father. There is one that accuses me, even Moses, in whom you trust. See, we're talking about God speaking to Moses. I'm going to send the prophet like unto you. He says, you believe Moses, but you won't believe what Moses said. He said, if you believe Moses, you'll believe me. For he wrote it. What Jesus is here doing, he is vindicating it. And helping you and I to understand the books of Moses, which is the first five books of the Bible called the Pentateuch. He's confirming those books to be true. Thousands of years later. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. And Deuteronomy. The book Moses, the books of Moses. He said, if you believe Moses, you believe me. I want to quickly go to another passage of scripture in Luke chapter 16. There's a reference made to Moses in this passage of scripture. God says there was a certain beggar named Lazarus that laid at the gate of the rich man. And there was a reason. Lazarus died, was scared by the age of Abraham's bosom. The beggar also died and inhaled. He lifted up his eyes to the He was suffering there. And in verse 27, he began to pray, which is something he had not done previously. Had he had prayed before, he would not have to pray this prayer. And he's praying to call him Father Abraham. He was praying with Abraham, the one that made the promise, so he, has no, he had no excuse. He knew something about Abraham, the one that we talked about earlier before we began to talk about Moses and the promise of that seed. But he's praying to him. He don't really know how to pray, but he's praying. He's in a desperate situation. And he said, Father, I pray that you would send Lazarus, he's referring to Lazarus here, to my father's house. There's one thing you can know. There is no unbelievers in hell. Not after the fact. But they obviously are before the fact or they wouldn't be there. But immediately, on passing, people who are not believers today. So don't be intimidated by all the rhetoric and by all the unbelief and hate in the world toward God's people. They're no different than they were then. They're just in darkness. That's right. Walking in darkness blind. They don't know. 
for because we know what we're responsible. And you and I can see things differently than they do because we do know the truth. But this is what he said in verse 20. He said, I got five brothers. If they don't get right, they come in the same place. Mm -hmm. But he's praying. He said, I don't want them to come to this place of torment. But this was the response. Abraham saith to him, they have Moses and the prophets. Mm -hmm. So what was he saying? There's a path to redemption. It goes all the way back to the beginning of the Bible. He has Moses and the prophets. You have the word of God. Then you hear them. He was implying that if Lazarus rose from the dead, that they'd be saved. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, there is one that rose from the dead, and people still don't believe. Amen. He was seen of over 500 people at once. People, people still will not believe. See, that's, it's not about it. It's about believing what God's Word says initially, and then faith to follow that path will come into your life if you'll trust in the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one rose from the dead, they will repent. And this was what his words were back to him. And he said unto him, If they won't hear Moses and the prophets, they won't hear the one rose from the dead. Amen. So don't take light the presentation of the gospel. It's powerful. Amen. In fact, God's choice to save the world, He calls it the foolishness of preaching. We know the world calls it foolishness. But to them that believe, it's the power of God. Amen. For salvation. It's that incorruptible seed. That is typical of who Jesus Himself is. It's the Word of God. It's not the letter of the Word, but it's who the Word of God will point you to. And that's Jesus Christ, our Lord. And in closing, this is what John said in 1 John 5, beginning with verse number 10. He said, He that believeth on the Son hath the witness in Himself. He that believeth not God is calling God a lie. Because he believeth not the record that God gave of his sin. God will not force us to believe. But he says we can, if we will, if we will choose. To the world, seeing is believing. It's not blind faith. It's faith documented, based upon documented truth. And this is where we stand. And this is where we set our anchor. We don't have to prove anything to anybody except what God's will is for our life. Amen. We do have to prove that. That good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God expects us to. He given us power to do it. And He said, this is the record that God gave. Our God hath given unto us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. Thank you. So where do you stand? I don't know how we can present it any different than how we present it. The path to redemption. And if you haven't experienced the transforming power of God to save you from the bondage of sin of death, you have the privilege to do it today. Yes. You may have been once given your heart to God and turned your back and walked away as a result of temptation or failure and, and thinks that there's no hope for you. I'm here to tell you, He's your only hope. And he's the only hope you need. But you must make to choose it and to trust in God's redemption for you. He asked God you would be needed to redeem him. And he went through great leaps for hundreds of years to bring it about in the fullness of time. We'll talk about that next week. But it's a done deal. Amen. We're reading a lot of things about the path that led to that, but it's a done deal. So I'm going to ask you today. If you're here, you say, Brother Bell, I, I'll tell you what, I'll struggle with faith. Faith will help you to understand. Seeing is believing, but God says by faith we understand that the world is defined by the Word of God. You cannot understand that apart from it. But if you and I would believe that whatever faith God has given you, He would not be dealing with your heart and soul if He hadn't given you sufficient faith to, for you to respond how He wants you to today. He'll give you sufficient faith to do that, not beyond that. But He will give you sufficient faith to do that. He'll give you sufficient faith to say that I will publicly confess Christ before man. I'll step forward and confess that I want to believe one of His, and from this moment in time, I will be that. 
He's given me sufficient faith today to take the first step. So I'm going to ask you to do something. Stand all over the congregation. And if you're here, you may have heard this message many times. or should have. But God is speaking to your heart today. And today is the day for you to be saved. God's path of redemption is caught up with you. And you now know it. And you have a responsibility. God says it will be required of you. If you don't get right with God and you die and go to hell, this message today will be brought up to you. You will remember what I've preached today. You may not remember it tomorrow if you refuse to reject it. But when you wake up in hell, you will remember what I've said today. There's no doubt in my mind. God will require it. So I'm going to ask you to do something. Will you bold and step out by faith today? And come forward and say, I'm going to be one of God's. Or if you're in doubt, you've been caught up temptation and unbelief. I heard you to come as we near our faith this morning. We'll give you an opportunity. Brad is going to play. The Holy Spirit's at work doing a powerful work right now in this house. So I'm going to ask if you will, if you respond. Will you come to me, Jesus says. I stand at your door and knock. And if you'll open that door, he says, I will come into you. So will you do it today? Give you the opportunity to come. My Christians are praying in your heart with the struggle of giving birth to a soul today. Will you join with me in that prayer? Thank you, Jesus. Come on, step out.